Hello and welcome to the Kick in the Creatives podcast, hosted by myself, Sandra Busby, and my fellow creative, Tara Roskell, offering you interviews, inspiration, motivation, and a gentle prod in the right direction. And for lots more information, challenges, and other useful tools to help you get creating, you can go to www.kickinthecreatives.com. And of course, this is where you can also find today's show notes. Enjoy the show. Hello, creatives. Oh, that was new. I know. <laughs> I just get, I just think everyone must be so bored. I've said this before, because every, every single episode we do, I'm like, welcome to today's episode. I thought, oh God, they must be thinking, oh, oh think I think of it's a, fine. There think you go. of a new, think of a new way of, of saying hello. But yes, welcome to today's episode. And today we're going to talk about the most important skills an artist can have. Um, but before we get onto that, we want to say a big thank you, as always, to our latest Kofi supporters, because... You really help us to keep this podcast going. And we're going to thank each of you at the end of the show. Yeah, we really do appreciate that support because not only does it help us towards the cost of running Kicking the Creatives, which helps us keep doing what we do, but it also shows that you like what we do. So a big thank you. And we also want to thank our sponsor, Evolve. Evolve can teach you to paint in a realism style to a professional level in a year or less. Not only do they provide all the lessons and the support online, but they also send you all the materials you'll need. So you can watch a free art masterclass from Evolve by going to kickinthecreatives.com forward slash Evolve webinar. And if you want to hear more about the Evolve program, you can go back and listen to episode 67 and episode 73. Yeah, that's well worth a watch that webinar, isn't it? It really is. Um, also, if you haven't already heard, we have finally released our course, which is how to create characters and cartoons. And right now we have an early bird offer of just $29. Uh, so if you're stuck for ideas for Christmas, maybe, um, then that would make the perfect gift for someone, you know, who enjoys drawing, if not for yourself. And you can find the link to the course on our website or go to kick in the creatives dot com forward slash cartoon course to find out more and uh, thanks to everyone who's been sharing their work for the challenges with us on social media um i've got quite a few i no doubt i've stolen some from you tara because i've got no idea who you've written down and, and you've got no idea who i've written down so apologies if i if i've stolen any but um i've got jody croft she's been doing the creep toba challenge and I've loved her stuff. And she did this little bird and she called it her skull bird. And it was kind of a real mix of kind of really cute, but really creepy. It was just obviously it was a bird with a, a skull as a, a head, which was, yeah, weird. <laughs> but I loved it. Um, Terra Letness a yellow. I'm so sorry if I've pronounced that wrong. Um, but uh, Tara did a fantastic drawing for Quick Kick October of a group of pumpkins using coloured pencils. Um, and actually, she's done a few black and white ones as well. I know she was kind of torn between the two, whether it was the black and white drawings or the coloured pencil ones. But honestly, this pumpkin drawing, I don't know if you saw it, Tara. Um, I did, yeah. Yeah, it was It was the glow. She She manages to get it like nail it just using colored pencils beautiful and um she did the same in black and white though which was i found really amazing um yeah so michael beckett he's been doing the creek toba challenge and his drawings have been fantastic um i think yesterday it was i saw he had, he did a like a black cat with this toy and he said that he'd been procrastinating because he wasn't sure that it was going to turn out very well but of course it did it was absolutely brilliant so um that'll teach you not to procrastinate michael just get it done <laughs> and also one more one more john munro it was really great to see john big, dipping back into um into the facebook group and of course he's doing the october poet challenge and he's such a great writer he's he's a, he's actually got his own writing group called right i think it's writing visionaries isn't it so um if you're a listener who likes writing you should definitely check that one out have I stolen any of yours, Tara? Yeah, you did. You sold Jodie. So I'm so sorry. That's all right. <laughs> uh, I've just got a couple. So I've got Kimmy QN, 
And I really loved her fantastic drawing of this young man watch, washing his hair, fantastic. Did you see that picture? I Look did. That. Yeah, great she, reference photo. And she just put so much expression into this drawing. I really, really love that. Mm. And then also Bradley Bergen, he's doing Inktober and he created this really cute cartoon of this girl wearing an armadillo costume. It was kind of um, just really quirky. Who, who did it remind me of? There's a style of a cartoonist. It reminded me of a bit, but I can't think who it is. That's not very good, is it? <laughs> there we go. Never mind. Anyway, what is new with you? Quite a lot, actually. Quite a lot. Yeah. And that makes a change because quite often we go, oh, not a lot at the moment. <laughs> I've actually quite a lot this time. Um, yeah, I've just had six of my paintings uh, collected to go into a gallery, which is absolutely fantastic. And better still, two of them have actually been put in the window. I was really chuffed when I heard that. Um, so what happened was Charlie, my son, was on his way um, somewhere miles away and he just happened to be going through the the place where this gallery is and he, he phoned me up and said, Mum, said, um, I've just seen two of your paintings in the window of, of the gallery. I was like, oh, that's I, that's really nice to be in the window. So I made him turn around and take a photo for my Instagram. <laughs> so that was nice. Um, and actually, since then, one of them sold. I had to go and collect it because um, one of them sold to someone privately. So they've actually only got five of the paintings now. And that one that sold was the lights, you know, the hand wrapped in the fairy lights. Yeah. So that was the one that went into the Mal Gallery exhibition. So... I had a feeling that was going to go. It's one of those paintings where I had so many people really interested in that painting. And yet I was thinking, well, are you going to buy it then? (laughs) Keep showing all this interest. (laughs) Is anyone going to actually buy this painting? Because I had so many messages about it and like people saying, oh, you know, I found that one really spiritual and and it really, you know, this is a real deep painting and this made me feel like this and made me feel like that. And I was like, this is great. This is great. But you know, now buy it. Buy, buy, buy the thing. You know, if it makes you feel like that, it's only. It's, you know, I haven't got any more. It's just the one. Anyway, so that one's gone. Um, anyway, the gallery are holding an exhibition in November, which um, the paintings are going to be included in. So yeah, I'm very excited about that. And actually, they've said to me, if you happen to get any more done before then then do let us know we'll we'll hang them and I'm like oh my god I, you know it takes so long for the oils to dry and I, so I thought right I'm going to get two paintings on the go um at once so it, it just depends how much time I get really on it but it would be great even if I could just get one done but of course I'm back on the marbles I haven't done marbles for ages and they were calling me so I decided you both know of what? them both are marbles, uh, are they? Well, they're both feature. Well, one features marbles alone, and the other one is um, marbles and bottles. So, what about you, Tara? What's new with you? Well, I've been experimenting with ideas for a new collection. So, I still want to retain the sort of style I'm doing now, but I was just um, experimenting with little ways to push it in different directions. You've se- you've seen one. I have shown one on social media, oh, but I started experimenting with this sort of graffiti type feel yeah i love it um i tried one with a white background and then one with the ink background but i want to introduce some words and i've just been tearing up newspapers but then i had a bit of an epiphany i know i got a, a text saying sandra i've had a i've had an epiphany I thought, oh my god i want to know what it is and that's what oh. we were talking about the other day wasn't it your epiphany <laughs> yeah so with other I, things. Was, I was listening to a video by um A woman called Marissa who has creativethursday.com, her website is. And this video was about, it was actually about social media. But she was saying how in social media you want to try and include a bit of like what you stand for and what you stand against. But I guess give a bit of personality is kind of what she's saying, isn't it? A Mm. bit about you. Yeah. And um, I guess that must have gone in my head because one of the things that, bugs both me and you isn't it is when people quash someone's creative con- or confidence in general by yes. saying just the most thoughtless of thing that has no it has no helpfulness about it at all mm. my example really is that one i've said before where 
when I was just about to complete my graphic design course, I went to see a company that my tutor suggests I go and show my portfolio to. And I showed him my work. And then he says to me, well, I don't think you'll get a job in graphic design. If you're lucky, you might get in a printer's. Um, and I just thought, um, and at the time, it was like just completely gutting. Because essentially, you're saying, well, you're rubbish. Yeah. Whereas what he should have said, if he didn't think I was very good, is I think you could do with working on your layout skills. Or what I would suggest is that you go through these books and set yourself a project to do this and this and this. That, in my opinion. So anyway, the, the idea behind this is we all have these things that have been said, like maybe a teacher saying you're rubbish at drawing. So what I want to do is bring those words into my faces. So I'm essentially tearing up those phrases that those people have said. And it really excited me when I thought about this. <laughs> I don't know why, but the idea of this tearing up these phrases and then putting them in my work and so they'll be partially visible maybe, or I'm not quite sure yet, but it started as being obviously about the things I've been told and things because we do kicking the creatives. We have, we've had like, quite a few people, haven't we, yeah. say that, like, say when they were like 10 or whatever, they had a teacher say, oh, no, you're ne not going to be an artist. And that's it. They might not draw again for yeah. 20 years. Yeah. Um, so it, that's what started it. But yeah. I was thinking about this the other day. And um, it could be anything. I'd kind of like it to start off with being real experiences. And the only thing I've just been I've been thinking about is I yeah. I still think they can be weird characters, can't they? There's no yeah, absolutely. Need, no reason. So they can still have their weird glasses and slight steampunk weirdo look. Yeah, definitely. I think that's yeah, that's what makes your but, yeah. work your work. So, yeah, I did that did quite excite me. But and then there was another thing I've just been um I've been carrying on with my social media experimentation. You know, I've been doing a lot more short form video. Yeah. We've been talking about, and uh, I did. I tell you, I told you about that video that really got loads of views, didn't I? Yes, eighteen was it eighteen thousand so or something? Nineteen thousand. Now this is bizarre, right? Because I make reels for you know for my Instagram, and I've been posting them other places as well. And normally they might get you know five hundred thousand views, or you know get the odd one or get a, a few thousand. And this one got nineteen thousand. Now. But the thing is, I do not know why, because all it was was literally me standing there. I had the back of my painting to face the camera, and then I turned it around so, you could, so it revealed what it was. That was yeah. it, and I put, <clears throat> can you help me with a title? But I'd spent ages on some other videos. Did you that note one, down the time? Did you note down the time and day that you, <laughs> you put it on? No, but it's just... So I tried, I, as an experiment yesterday, I did a repeat not with the same painting, but no. at the same time when I recorded that one, I recorded another one turning around. Mm -hmm. So I thought, I'm going to do exactly the same thing with this painting, uh, with this video. I'm going to put it out. I'm going to put the same title on it. Um, can you help me with the title? Um, it got 600 views. Oh, how interesting. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Know why. So maybe, maybe it's to do as much with the date, rather the time of day and the day you're posting as well to some degree. Because they do Who say knows? that, don't they? It well, could maybe be people like that painting I, I've never, I mean, I, I do the odd reels here and there. And I swear I'd have to get my boobs out, I think, to have any, any more than about 100. <laughs> I, just, I don't know what I do or don't do, that, but I, don't, I certainly don't get that kind of attention. <laughs> well, I don't normally either. <laughs> it was very weird. And, it's like, and the weird thing is as well, I posted that, like I said, to like a YouTube as a short yeah. and um, to TikTok. And now it's actually picking up a little bit on TikTok, that one. Not massively. But YouTube, I think I've got two views. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, isn't it, how it works? Who, who yeah, can... I, honestly, I honestly don't know is the answer. Yeah. But that, that was insane. I think that must be your most popular reel yet then, I guess. The yeah, 18, 19,001. Can Which I just ask you then? I, I knew why. Yeah. So you got 19,000 views. Did you gain any extra followers from that? Yes, oh, I did. Good. Um, but it, I've also gained followers when I've not posted for a bit, which is kind of weird. You know, like if I've 
some sometimes like over the weekend when you don't post because I, I tend to post five days a week and then I don't yeah. post at weekends um and sometimes I'll suddenly get a load of followers at the weekend so I honestly don't know <laughs> I don't know how I yeah it was out. funny when I took a break from, for about three or four weeks from social media and in that time I got more followers <laughs> than I was getting when I was posting which was interesting <laughs> Yeah, I do That's wonder fair. sometimes if the algorithm kicks in mm. and does that to try and encourage you to post. Yeah, maybe. I think I you, know. I mean, you've got an awful lot more followers than me because you do an awful lot more on social media than I do. I'm still on a mere 924. So, yeah. But, you yeah. know, they're all real. <laughs> I'd like to get mine up to 10 by ne- uh, next year. I'd like to get mine up to 1,000. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's my goal before Christmas. That'd be good. Oh dear. Anyway, right. So is that all that's new with you? Yeah, that's all that's new. Okay, so let's get on to today's topic. Um, And we are going to talk about the most important skills an artist can have. And um, I suppose you might think that the most important skills are quite obvious and they should revolve around knowing how to draw and paint. But actually... You know, that's almost like the least thing you need to be good at. There are so many more skills you need to work on if you want to actually be a successful artist. You know, being good at what you do, ridiculous as it sounds, it's not enough anymore. (laughs) We've got to be performing monkeys, as we've just said. But I think one of the most important skills you need is actually just so simple, but it's the ability to make decisions and In the studio, obviously not outside the studio, but in the studio or wherever you do your art, a bad decision is actually way better than no decision at all. If you find you're not able to make a decision, that just leads to procrastination, which for artists is, well, it's the ultimate enemy, isn't it? Procrastination. So what uh, decision are you talking about here? Okay, for a start, making a decision that you're going to do something today that moves you forward in some way in your art career or whatever you want to call it. So, for example, the other day I made that decision that I would email a gallery I'd had my eye on for a Uh, quite a while a long time about three years actually (laughs) so there's me not being very decisive being too scared to contact them but I woke up one morning I thought you know what I'm making a decision here I'm going to contact them what's the worst that can happen they can say no so I that was my decision for that day um and I emailed them and within 40 minutes I got a response saying we'd love to come and see your work in the flesh and that, and then, of course, they, they actually came to the studio and said a big fat yes, please, which I was absolutely delighted about. Now, you know, whether they'd said yes or no, that was a positive move and something I could cross off my list. I'd made the decision to try. I'd tried and it had or hadn't worked or whatever. You know, there are there are other gal- galleries out there, I guess. It's just I happen to really want that one. But um, if you think about it, everything that happens from here on whether it, you know, if they sell a painting or whatever, it stems from that one decision I made to send them that email. So it's about making decisions that move you forward. Another important decision that will move you forward is to decide to start something, start anything, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. If you don't know what to work on next, then that should be your next decision. What am I going to work on today? I need to make a decision, otherwise I'm not going to work on anything. And, you, you know, you should just make a decision and make it in a in good time. Like I said, a bad decision is way better than no decision at all because even if you make a decision to paint something because you can't think of anything to paint and that goes horribly wrong, at least you've moved forward and you've learnt something from that painting and you've been creating and you've been doing do you know what I mean? Give yourself a deadline if it, if it helps. I mean, we could do, I think, we could do an entire episode on the importance of being decisive. But I would definitely say that's the top thing that we need to be good at. Making yourself get up in the morning and go, right, what am I going to be doing today? I must make a decision and I need to do it. It might be as well, like, perhaps you are not particularly good at a specific area in your art. Maybe you're really good at one thing, but actually you don't, do much of something else and it's more because you're not very good at it well make a decision if you don't know what to paint okay I'm going to work on that today I want to get better 
Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I put off doing that 50 ways to draw a face for ages. Mm. That, that was so bad. And my decision then should have just been to start because that moved me forward so much. Yeah, and how long did you wait to start? About a year. Yeah, exactly. And you'd have done that a year earlier if you'd just started, yeah. I'd had the idea for it, you know, a year yeah. earlier. So, yeah, it's crazy. Um, and I guess that kind of links on to the next one that I've got, which is self-discipline, because it's all about actually making that decision and then sticking with it. And there is just so much self-discipline involved with art, especially if you want to take it seriously. I mean, even get into grips with a medium or subject and hone in that craft. It really takes some dedication. You've got to put that time aside. Um, like, you know, I remember trying to get to grips with watercolour I've mentioned before. You can't do it just by doing it one day, which is why I think challenges like ours and other art challenges are just so, so important because I'm the worst person. I'm so bad discipline if I haven't got to do something then it's it's so difficult to I might do it once but then I might not do it the next day unless I've promised myself through a challenge that I'm going to do it do you find that yeah absolutely yeah. I'm, <laughs> we do these episodes and we're not you know we're not saying we're very good at all of them <laughs> it's just that they really help it really helps if you are but yeah discipline oh my gosh I'm not overly good at that um no but that said like like you were talking about you know you want to get good at a specific thing well you know I made the decision once I'd fallen in love with oils I thought I I really need to practice this if I'm going to get any good and I put all of my time into that so yeah that was that was discipline it was making myself keep doing it and doing it until I'd got better yeah I think It's that level of how much you want it, isn't it? So it probably depends whether you're saying, oh, I quite fancy learning watercolours to, Mm. oh, I really want to to learn. Do you know what I mean? It's that. So if you just quite fancy it, you probably don't put the time in quite the same, which is our next point, funny enough, time management skills, which is another thing I'm not very good at. (laughs) I don't know why why I've got these ones, because you give me the ones I've got at. I'm not allowed to Oh, two beeps. Um, <laughs> yes, so I'm very bad at that. And I must have searched for I don't know how many different apps to try and track my, not track my time, but, you know, like schedule things. Yeah. And I can never find one that does everything I want because I need one almost that comes and clonks me on the head and say, you shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> but there isn't one. There isn't one. But, yeah, I have basically found this app that is one of the better ones. I, I was using to do and then... I started using this one called Structured. Um, and what I what I quite like about this one is I don't use it all the time. I just use it when I've got quite a lot of things I want to get done, you know, all in a day. And um, you can see the time going down. So you can set, so you, you might say, I'm going to be um, practicing my watercolour or drawing between 9 and 11.30. So you'll set it and then... As, if you look on screen, you can gradually see the time going, which is quite interesting. And then it'll also pop a little message up on your screen or your phone uh, saying, oh, next task. So it kind of gives you a reminder of what's coming next, which I quite like. Um, organisational skills, that's another one. And I don't mean the same sort of skills as you're talking about. I'm talking about, well, there's a few things, really. You can't work, well, unless you're Tara. <laughs> well some people some people can but I can't let me put it this way I can't work with clarity as an artist if my studio is in a mess and my materials are all over the place some artists actually thrive in that kind of environment I can't um and I think the same applies if I was working in an office I wouldn't I'd hate to go in there and find post-it notes absolutely all over the place pens strewn across the desk paperwork here there and everywhere I'd I'd have to have everything in a an order this is you know this is one particular thing you've got to do and then after that you've got to do this I'd have to have that and I'm the same in my studio you know if it's a mess or it's untidy or it's dirty I, I can't work yeah having a clear idea of what you're planning to do that day in your studio so 
I keep saying studio. Obviously, I realise not everyone's got a studio, but you know what I mean. I find that if I don't know what my aim is for that particular day when I go in the art studio, then I kind of do a bit of this and a bit of that. And I don't really know what I'm starting with. And then I end up getting absolutely nothing done. And it feels like I'll go in and I think, God, that was such an unproductive day. So when you go in, just start something, have an idea in advance of what your goal is for that day, preferably the night before, figure out a goal for the day ahead. So for instance, my goal next time I go in my studio might be to come up with a new setup. I love that feeling of going in there with a clear idea of what I'm doing. Right, I know I've got to do that. Just get on with it straight away. You also need to be able to stay focused, of course. If It's no point in going in there and with all this in your mind and thinking, right, I'm going to do this today. And then all of a sudden your phone pings and you're like, oh, who's this? You know, and then you end up going on social media or something and going down that rabbit hole. It's really tricky to stay focused, actually. It's really tricky to avoid distractions when you're in the studio, so it can undo everything I've just said. So we actually did a whole episode, didn't we, on how to stay focused on your art, and uh, that was episode number 118. And I know that in that episode, as well as sharing loads of general tips on staying focused, we also shared some really useful apps to help you avoid distractions. So if you've got trouble in that area, I think that episode's well worth a listen. Um, you also need skills to have a basic knowledge of your materials. And when I say basic, I guess you start off with a basic knowledge of your materials. There's just so many materials to choose from, isn't there, as an artist? Yeah. So I guess the first thing is at least narrowing them down a little bit. Yeah. And like for me, that was easy because there's definite things I don't like. Probably for you as well, you don't like anything that doesn't let you be fairly accurate, do you? So not only do you need to kind of narrow the materials you want to use down, then you need to get a handle on how to use them properly. And when I say properly, there isn't actually a proper way, I suppose, to to use a lot of materials. But... You can start off like, say, for example, when I started off with neo colours, I sort of you know, was dabbling with them. But then you need to work out what they can do and you'll find out new things that you can do with them. So first of all, I didn't realise until somebody told me that you can actually use near colours with gesso and matte medium. And, um, so all these things obviously take a bit of time. And again, that discipline coming into it to actually learn how to do these and hone your skills. Um, Right, okay, so you also need a level of compositional skills and I'm not just talking about the usual rule of thirds here. There's a lot more to compositional skills than that. Um, So you need to be able to look at the overall shape of your composition and aim for something that leads your eye around or through the canvas. I also like to look for a pattern of lights and darks across my canvas, um, which, you know... I can see, you know, as a rule anyway, but if you struggle to see that, just take a photo of your image, turn it to black and white, and what you're looking for is, um, is I guess, a, a nice balance of tones across the canvas rather than, you know, one side being heavily one thing and the other being heavily the other. Do you know what I mean? I like to make sure there's a balance across the whole image. And the same applies to colour, actually, you know, you'll often see artists, won't you? They'll 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 see that there's a colour in one area of their painting, but they they kind of need, even if it's not there, to introduce it somehow into a different area just to harmonise that. You know, to kind of balance balance the colours. And these are all skills that they they'll come with practice over time anyway, and you'll learn them as the more you do it. But they are actually really important to grasp. So that's another one. That thing with the colours was so big for me when mm. I learned that. Yeah. And it, 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 it's so amazing how that can change an entire picture. Like if you yeah. drew, draw something and say, uh, I don't know, one of the cheeks on the person has got a bit of red in it or something, or there's a red mark on the face or something. Mm. And then it just if you then drop something just down the other side, slightly lower or something to balance it, mm. it's incredible the difference that makes. And yet you think in the real world, that's probably not really there. But I suppose when we're seeing things through like um, a lens or through a small area, 
I don't know, it just seems to completely balance it off, doesn't it? Yeah, I think with art, sometimes you have to do what's right for the painting rather than what you actually see all the time, you know? Yeah, definitely. Mm. I think also as artists, we need to have imagination. And now this is a really funny one because you'll actually get some people who think, as artists even, they haven't got imagination. I think you used to think this a bit, didn't you? Yeah, I'm not very good at working from imagination, to be honest. But but we have a whole episode on this, uh, episode 84, using imagination in your art, even if you don't think you have any. Because as artists, even if we don't think we are, we tend to be using our imagination. Like Even like the thing we just said with adding a dot of colour in somewhere else. That's yeah, using that's your true. imagination. It's yeah. not there. So hmm. you've made that up. Um, even so, if you're looking at a scene and there's a load of dustbins in it and you don't want a dustbin, so maybe you just put a little sapling tree or something, that's using your imagination. And we all need to have a little bit of that just to make those pictures have that extra little ping, I think. Well, there's a, you've got loads of imagination. <laughs> that's one thing you're, you've got in bucket loads. Yeah. Well, I didn't used to think I had. Because um, another one of my phrases, do you remember, um, you know, these phrases I was talking about from my um, oh yeah, my new images? One of them is, you're not creative enough. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. So um, it, it's funny. Cause, so I think, and now this is going to sound funny, but I think imagination can also be trained somewhat. Okay. Because I think, I think that sometimes just think you haven't got imagination and I think it's because you haven't necessarily been taught techniques or you've been stuck in your box and that's a horrible thing to say but what I mean is you know that you like drawing this way or that's what you've been taught to draw this way and no one's ever said to you oh what about if you do if you do this because people tend to think that when someone says can you draw from imagination that's like someone saying to you and it's like that typical school I don't know if you had this school exercise I remember it and someone said you need to let's draw a scene imagine you're in an alien world draw a scene now if someone said to me now it'd be a disaster I was gonna say if somebody said that to me now I'd look at them and go no I can't do that exactly I need to go to another planet and see an alien (laughs) and then I'll sit and draw it (laughs) Yeah, so so the only way I would be able to do that now, I would be, I'd have to, and obviously that wouldn't appeal to me, the landscape wouldn't appeal to you probably either, but would be if we gathered together loads of reference. So maybe we gathered together a picture of a desert and then maybe an underwater scene. Mm. And then you kind of think, oh, I'm going to take, I'm going to take that bit from the desert. I'm going to take that bit from the underwater scene. Do you know what I mean? And you, mm. I just don't think imagination is always what we think. I mean, there are geniuses who can just pull something out of the head. Yeah, I was. I, I remember when somebody once said, I don't know if this is really imagination, but somebody once said to me, it was a kid actually. They said, "Can you draw me a cow?" <laughs> I looked at this kid and went, "Ah." Uh, I, just, I couldn't think how to draw a cat because I needed one in front of me to be able to draw it. If, if she just said draw a cat, I could draw a cat because I've seen, I've drawn cats loads of times, only because of Felicity Fizz, you know what I mean? Um, if she oh, had yeah. a cat. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I suppose that comes with just when you do a lot of something, then later on down the line, if somebody said, can you draw me a this? You're like, yeah, I can do that because I've drawn it loads of times. But if somebody just said i don't know it's a bit different if somebody said draw, draw the alien scene yeah <laughs> or if somebody said draw um can you draw a collection of wine bottles and cups and saucers and in or even a i don't know anything like i'd be like yeah of course i can that can i can anyone can pluck that out of their imagination because they see those things on a daily basis but if you don't happen to be walking past cows every day you'd be like oh god um yeah i i, I know the face but i can't i'm trying to think of how their body shape is, do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's like um, Carmel that we had on the podcast um, not long ago. Yeah. I don't know what episode that was, but go back and check it. She does um, abstract figurative work. And we asked her whether she used 
reference because she creates female bodies but they they are a bit abstract aren't they they're not yeah. totally straightforward and she does those from imagination but she says it's drawn from the fact that she went to life drawing classes for years yeah so it's like the thing you said that you can draw a cat because you've drawn a cat loads of times so yeah she kind of has the reference in her head i guess yeah but they, i do think imagination can be taught somewhat yeah, I think you're right. So, yeah, another thing, one of the skill you need is being brave and open to experimentation because I think as artists we need to be prepared to progress our art. We don't want to get stuck in that rut, do we? So we have to be brave or even it could be brave, you know, doing things like you did with the gallery. But if we don't experiment, our art will just stay the same. It might improve in skill level. But even then, I think you've got to experiment. Like you said before, when you, you by mistake, found out about blurring the edges in your oil yeah. painting. Mm. If you hadn't have done that, then you wouldn't have moved on to the next level. And I think you've even got to be prepared to be brave and ruin something. Not deliberately, but say, for example, when I was doing those faces with the little characters around the eye, I would often test them out first on computer. So I would take a photo of my painting and then I would try the thing out digitally. But then I actually had to do it. And I always knew that as I was drawing this thing in, the rest of the painting was pretty much finished and I just had to get this character right. So by doing that, I could completely muck the thing up if I didn't do it right. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, and I think you've got to be prepared to ruin something. And did you ever ruin anything doing that? Uh, well, I did some that I wouldn't, didn't necessarily like that much or, do you know what I mean? Uh, cause, because I'm not particularly good at Acura and it's quite hard actually to draw over the top of that. Mm. Um, so some would have been a bit wobblier. It is a horrible feeling though when you do something, you're like, oh, oh, it was so much better before I did that. Yeah. Isn't it? Especially if you can't yeah. undo what you've done. It's um, And what, what's that about? That's about your next uh, thing, isn't it really? what knowing when to stop oh, how did you it. know i was yeah. going to talk about that <laughs> <laughs> anyone would think you could see my bullet points <laughs> yeah yeah knowing when to stop oh my gosh that's so so important it really really is you know when is a piece of art finished and i've done this before where i've i've got to that point where i'm like oh, i'm so happy with this i'm really happy with it and then i just look at it and think yep that's it. I've finished. I'll, I'll put it aside for a couple of days and look at it again and, and just check. But it's really nice. Then a couple of days later, I go, oh, actually, I could just brighten that color a bit there or maybe tone down that bit there. And then I, I'll, I'll look at that and think, oh, no, I've, it was better before I did that. And then what I'll do is I'll think, OK, well, maybe then if I do this area, that will balance that out. And before I know it, the painting is not the painting it was at all. And I've done that before. It's not something I do often because you learn as you, with experience, that actually you're best stopping earlier than you should, than later than you should. Yeah. You know, I mean, there was a saying, wasn't there? The phrase that Van, I think it was Van Gogh. I'm probably completely wrong. I'm pretty sure it was Van Gogh who once said, painting is never finished, it's merely abandoned. But there is nothing yeah. that will kill a piece of art more than one that's been overworked, honestly. And the way I've learned to know when to stop is really the moment the brush strokes stop making a difference, for better or for worse, that's when I put the brush down. Because the problem is once you've overworked it, it's incredibly hard to pull it back. So it's better to actually practice restraint than to do that. I, I, I can literally think of a lot of paintings in the past that I've, I've had to learn that horrible mistake from. And also the, uh, the, the brain has an amazing skill of, of filling in the gaps. If there's something missing, it won't notice. It'll fill it in if there's enough information yeah, I, around it. I've tried to rescue paintings that aren't good in the first place as well. I don't know if you've ever done this. So um, I've, I've maybe drawn a face and I think, yeah, I don't, it's not really working. I don't really like it. So I think, oh, I know. I'll try this. I'll add in some stuff over there and I think, yeah, that's not really working either. I'll add stuff in over here. And then, then about half an hour later after you've been fiddling, you think, oh, this may as well just go in the bin. 
Yeah. Because basically you've, you've had something and it was never good in the first place and then you've tried to save it and it just does not work. Yeah, because you think, oh, I've spent all that time on it. I always yeah. remember this a painting I did years and years and years ago. It's an oil painting and there was... Um, a good two-thirds of the painting that I was absolutely ecstatic with. I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> I was like, this is so good. And then there was this one element that I just could I, it was just wrong. It was wrong on so many levels. I didn't, didn't like it. And I just kept on and on tinkering with this part of the painting. And I'm looking, we're looking, we're talking days of tinkering to try and get something right that was just. Uh, you know never going to get right I could never pull it back and in the end the only way I could stop myself from fiddling and wasting more and more time on this blooming painting was to um kick a hole through it that's what I ended up doing because I knew and it was heartbreaking because there was that there was those parts of that painting that I felt were probably my best work to date yeah and um and it was because of those parts that I, it just kept making me go over and over this other part. And I thought, I just, this is just never going to happen. I can, I've can, i got to destroy it, and I did destroy it. And, uh, yeah, so it's just, yeah, it's hard. It is heartbreaking. It's, yeah. it's something I suspect that most artists have had to do at some point. Yeah. Know? I mean, the funny thing is, like, I, ha- I have also done it with paintings that aren't working, and then you try something, and sometimes it does do something interesting you know because you try yeah. something different but the majority of the time once it's a goner it's a goner isn't it yes yeah yeah now i've got one that everybody will groan about that we all need and that is if we're going to sell a work we need marketing skills oh yeah Ugh. don't you feel like that yeah we we need to be able to talk about our work and we need to be able to sell ourselves and I don't mind sharing that I'm actually trying to get better this, at this at the moment. I've been trying for quite a long time. But um, it, it's quite difficult, I think, as artists, is finding good information to know how to do this. We, we all want a his step, 10 steps to learn to market and sell your art, you know, in a really good way because the problem is I guess every artist is slightly different and we're all trying to sell slightly different work maybe to different people Mm. but yeah uh, so I think that's a skill we're all trying to get and the difficulty I guess is just where do you find those resources to do that and where where do you think you find the resources to do that I've never learnt marketing skills via any particular place I think it's just things I've had to learn as I go because you know it's not like you're you're not you're not taught it not that I went to art college but you're not even taught it at art college are you you're taught to do it you're not taught to sell it which is bonkers really it should almost be completely man (laughs) it should almost be half of half of the curriculum I think should be marketing you know but no yeah. it's you just you just sort of see what other people are doing and think oh I'll try that then I'll try that and I mean yeah I mean you, you as you know I bought a course ages ago I am trying something else at the moment but I don't want to speak about that because I don't know if it's going to work or not yet <laughs> but um I um I bought a course do you remember a year or so ago and that was to teach you how to market and sell your art and I got to a point in that and it was to find your ideal customer and how do you find your ideal customer for weird abstract faces? Yeah. I think it, it's so much easier if you paint pet portraits. If you paint pet portraits, you just can go into Facebook, can't you? And there'll be groups of pet yeah. lovers mm. or dog lovers. And you can hang out there and you can start say, oh, yeah, I, oh, I do this. I paint pet portraits. You don't have to flog, flog. But you can gradually sort of talk about what you do and stuff and hopefully people get to know you. But if you do things like even what you do, probably, you, you can't go, oh, where's the still life lovers? <laughs> it's, it's not it's not no. as easy, is it? It's like, how do you how do you reach those people? Because social media, of course, they now really want you to pay money. So I, I suppose if you've got the money, one way is to try ads and see who bites your ads. But, yeah, um, yeah, it's that difficult thing of we gradually, I guess, pick up the skills to learn how to market our art. 
The problem is, I think, for artists is that we were talking about this earlier, weren't we, where often art is in, is way too cheap. I mean, I sell my art way too cheap, really, for the amount of hours I put into it. And then you were talking about the amount of time it takes faffing around for postage, you know, just trying to get... I mean, you're trying to post something at the moment, aren't you, to Finland, and that's become a bit of a nightmare. Um, it, you know, the, the cost of materials, everything is is costing a lot. And then not only that, but then you've got to... All, then you've got to sort of pay to to try and get it out there by doing an ad and it's all eating into that profit that you 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 want to make yeah. from the painting and in the end you've done a painting and made made next to no money because it's taken a lot not just to to work on it and to actually produce it but also then to try and get the eyes on it so there's a reason art should I be expensive also- and it's for the, all of that and more also with the the problem it is with ads um, if you're running ads, you need to learn how to do ads. Oh, God, and it's just constantly <laughs> so, like, oh. But need to learn how to do ads well, because if you put up an ad and your paintings don't sell, is that because the people didn't like your paintings? Is that because you're not good at doing the ads? Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's um, it's one of those difficult things, and I think, yeah, if we have been wanting for ages to have someone on who can give us some advice about marketing and selling art you know they give everybody yeah all the listeners advice on it and we still haven't yet found anyone um i'm doing something at the moment so we'll see what that works out like whether we can get someone on for doing mm. that or if you've got any suggestions if anybody wants to yeah, suggest someone let, let us know but also you need to be able to talk about your art as well and that's that's quite a tricky thing in itself we did a whole episode on this because i was having real problems in knowing what to say about mine anyway that is episode 112 why can't I talk about my art um, and I think that gets easier doesn't it yes I think it does because I, yeah. I think when you first start it you sort of feel like oh it seems like I'm showing off <laughs> but this is this always makes me laugh because obviously artists quite a lot of artists and we've all been guilty of this as big when we've been beginners is when you put something up and you go I did this um, ignore ignore the um, wonky ellipse or, or or ignore this bit. I'm not happy with that bit, but look at the rest, you know, I'm happy with that. And you think, oh, why do you point that out? If you were a tiler, right, or a, say, well, let's say a kitchen fitter, you would not go online and post a beautiful photograph of the kitchen you just fitted and you would not say, ignore the... Um, the unit doors i know they're slightly misaligned but anyway apart from that because no, <laughs> nobody not a single person out there that wanted a kitchen would give that a moment's more time because you just said actually i'm not so good at this bit so it's it's basically the same with art you can't you have to you have to be confident in what you've done and you have to sound confident in what you've done and sell yourself you know Another skill we need are basic technical skills. Now, you love this, Sandra, don't you? You don't have to be a complete computer whiz and have, like, wowsy computer skills, but it is really useful if you can just put together a really basic website, even if it's using one of the website builders, you know, the the Wix, the Weebly, the Squarespace, the Shopify type thing. Um, Or if you can actually do a basic scan or... Or, or you know how to photograph your art. I mean, that doesn't have to be with this big snazzy camera. It can just be with your phone, but you just know that you need to take it outside in, in decent light. Just having some very, very basic technical skills is, is something that is really useful. And also, another thing that you're going to grow at, social media skills. Yeah. <laughs> Which becomes more and more important that the years things go on and and I think it's kind of that is it a blessing or is it a curse because years ago the only way we could ever sell our work would have been to find a gallery that was going to take us so it was basically one person or you know a group of people saying yes or no yes you are worthy no you aren't worthy well now we can decide if we're worthy or we can decide if we're worthy but then we have to be able to get a message out there so everybody else thinks we're worthy so 
it really is important and especially at the moment short form video and when I say short form video what I mean is making vertical videos that are perhaps a minute or less in length that is becoming so important all these social media platforms are really favoring it the good thing is that you can at least repurpose those and use them in lots of different places so I've been making Instagram reels but then I'll also go and put that onto TikTok, which you've probably heard people shouting about. And now it actually has grown up quite a bit, TikTok. It's still supposed to be a lot easier to get people to see it. And I actually noticed, because I tried TikTok, I don't know how long. Do you remember we were dabbling with it before? Yeah. <laughs> and it was probably maybe a year, two years ago, I tried it. On, and Because it was supposed to be really easy to get picked up on there yeah. but it's, it was just so much of kids dancing at the time yeah and I kind of abandoned it and I decided to have another go now it's not as easy as it was before apparently to go viral on there but what I have noticed is there are now more business people on there so and it's becoming a search engine which and what I mean by that is you can now go in there and search um how to market my art and it will kick up someone who's done a little video about how to market their That's art. That's interesting. Or, you know. Yeah, it's obviously grown yeah. a lot. I mean, I haven't been on TikTok for years. I just haven't bothered because, like you say, it was just all, I don't know, 12-year-olds dancing. dancing around, I don't know, doing whatever. And and that's great for them. But it, I, I just was not interested. Yeah, it's definitely grown up. And what I have noticed is, so I just got started. I had about 200 followers. And I this was from a couple of years ago. And it was just stuck and I thought, I'm going to start doing these again and putting all the stuff. I've made it for Instagram. I might as well put it on there as well. I think people are repurposing their content. So they're, as well as putting them on Instagram, they're putting them on there. Because if they're making them, why not? Yes. I also think TikTok is getting a lot more press coverage. And a lot more people saying that you can get found a lot easier on TikTok than you can on Instagram. It's so hard to get seen now. Um I, I I started posting again, probably since we've got back from holiday, more seriously, like five days a week I've been posting. Mm. And um, I now can find that overnight I might have gone up by 100 followers. Wow. That would never happen on Instagram. I've still only got 600 and something, so I haven't got hardly any. But whereas it would go up and down about two followers on Instagram, you seem to be able to make much bigger little bigger jumps and more people have commented on my stuff now but also there's another place and that is um youtube youtube now do youtube shorts which are the same they're vertical quick videos and so if you're going to post it to instagram you may as well post it to there as well and that is supposed to be becoming quite big everywhere is about these little videos do you know who do you know how many um followers i've got on tiktok uh, no, because I didn't know. Have you got a personal account? The only reason I've, I opened an account was to follow Carmel. Um, oh, right. And I've never really been on it since, and I've just looked, and I've got one follower. It's Carmel. <laughs> so so now I feel like <laughs> I need it? to post I... something because she might be watching. <laughs> I'm sure she's not. Yeah, I can follow you later. You're going to have to follow me, Tara. I um, need to. Yeah, why don't you do a TikTok, why don't we do a TikTok challenge to get Sandra to 500 followers on tiktok there we go <laughs> so yeah let's do that follow me out of pity because <laughs> i don't have yeah. many i have one <laughs> be funny wouldn't it for next um next one we did i was like oh my god can you believe it i've got x amount It'd be so funny Ten thousand followers i'll post some things on there just some old stuff perhaps and see what happens anyway now i want to go back to photography skills if you're going to put a photograph of your work up on a website then a, a poor photograph that's slightly out of focus and in really poor light is just not going to sell your painting. It's just, it's going to turn people off, you know. So you have to sort of take a bit of time to find your way around your camera. And and you know what, YouTube is a brilliant place to find some really simple tips and tricks to get really good photos with just your smartphone. But just make sure you kind of learn the basics and try and get good photographs and that you know it particularly applies to when you're putting something on your website but also social media um but not just about the quality of photograph you take but also the 
the shots you get, like say the composition you get. So be a bit imaginative if you can, so you stand out from the rest. If you've done a painting, you don't necessarily have to just photograph it head on, you know, face on and crop it. You could then photograph it, I don't know, hanging on a wall or propped up um, on a shelf with some of the plant next to it or some fairy lights next to it or huh? hold it hold it yeah or hold it and spin hold around it. like tara did and get eighteen, nineteen thousand views <laughs> that kind of thing you know so just having a, a bit of savvy around your camera or your photography skills is a good thing um another skill you need is the ability well i don't know if this is a skill but having thick skin mm. i guess so you need to be open to criticism and other people's ideas because sometimes they are actually useful and helpful if they, if they do it in the right way and they can move us forward in the right direction. But we also need to be thick-skinned enough to completely ignore that criticism and try and not let it hang there, you know, like, like some of mine have from when I was a teenager. Uh, and then also another yicky, icky thing that we need to know is basic accounting skills. I thought this is going to take me so long to just try and understand this. I might as well pay someone to do it. And I, I know everybody can't do that, but it, and it also depends how much you're earning. Because if you're only earning a couple of hundred pounds, it's obviously not worth it. No, I, I, do you know what? I Yeah, obviously I keep a record. Uh, basically, I keep a record of everything I spend to do with my art business and yep. everything that I earn. Um, and then I use the accountant that we use for my husband, Paul's business, and they I give it all to them, and they kind of, they do my accounting for me as well, so. Yeah. So the ability to say no, that is something I've learned the hard way, as I've learned most of these things the hard way. I used to find it really, really hard to say no, especially to commissions. I remember when I got my first commission and I was I had such a buzz that somebody actually was willing to um, commission me to do something. I was just like, oh, I can't say no, you know, how, what a compliment. Um, and also, as you go on, at the end of the day, if you get a commission, you know it's a sale. So yeah. it's hard to say no, isn't it? But honestly, the stress that sometimes comes with the commissions, it's not really worth it. I get really stressed with commissions. I don't enjoy them. Uh, well, I say I don't enjoy them. There are the odd ones I do enjoy. Um, that great big marble painting I did, I've spoken about before. I, I really enjoyed that one because I just it was such a challenge and I, I really enjoyed that challenge. So whether or not it had, they'd liked it in the end or not, it would have, I'd have learned a lot from that painting. But generally speaking, commissions really put the pressure on. So even if I take them on, I'll never give them a completion date. I'll go, well, you know, I, I, I'll say yes, but I'm not going to say when. <laughs> but generally speaking, I just don't like doing them. I, I find them very um, stressful. As you know, Tara, because usually when I have a commission, you're the one that gets the brunt of all of my texts um venting my stress about it all <laughs> yeah yeah and it sounds mean as well but on another note if you're selling your art it doesn't mean you're obliged to sell it cheap to people you know um yes if it's your mum or your dad or your sister or your brother of course that's that's different isn't it but otherwise if somebody asks you to do them i'm going to put this in air quotes a quick sketch <laughs> you shouldn't feel like you can't charge them to do that what you can do instead, and this is the sort of thing I'll do, is I'll, um, you know, the last one I, the last painting I sold to someone I know, I, I obviously didn't charge the post, um, the postal charge, and I didn't charge the insurance that I would normally get when I'm posting it. I didn't make any money on the frame on it at all. That was cost price, that kind of thing. So I'm kind of doing it just cheaply in that way as I can. But I'm still making the right amount for the actual piece of art itself. Because if that person hadn't bought it, then somebody else could. And essentially, I'd be giving them, if I took £100 off, I'd be giving them 100 quid. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not going to do that. I can't do that, you know. So, yeah, learning how to say no. And it's actually very difficult to do that, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think I've got way better at that. 
as well. Yeah. But but with like graphic design, it was very much the same as you're saying about the commission. It, every job was like getting a commission. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But you couldn't say yeah, no because, to that because that's what you did. That's why you hate it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. Anyway, let's move on. We've got the answers to our last question, which was, you have $1,000 which you can either spend on a piece of art or buy art materials. What do you do and why? Cat Denisova. It's a tough one, she says. I think I would have to go with the art materials simply because in the current times, the amount of joy that I would get out of creating art with supplies costing $1,000 would be much higher than the enjoyment of owning a piece of new artwork. Hmm. I've got Ben King, and he says, materials for sure. But since I try not to spend extravagant amounts on supplies and make the best of what I've got, it would end up being a stockpile. I've got Jessica Wakefield Vetter. Art for sure. I work in my community art school, and the faculty are so very talented. I would love to own some of their work. I love how their creativity comes out in so many different ways. It's inspiring. I've got Andy W. Art. Mont Blanc would find this scruffy artist standing on the doorstep, demanding attention and insisting on buying an expensive pen. <laughs> I wonder if those Mont Blanc pens are actually all they're cracked up to be. I don't know. I, I do like know. Andy's answers, though. He's always got a good answer. Yeah, he has. I love his answers. Margaret Gray, either or scenarios give me a headache. I am reaching a point in my life where I question the value of owning things. Experiences are way more valuable to me now. So using the money for a mini holiday to make and see art and buying some plein air art supplies would be great. Also, visiting museums and galleries, supporting artists is hugely important, though. I wish we as people did more of that. It's an interesting answer, Margaret, because before your answer, I I was leaning towards buying a piece of art because a piece of art you have forever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, whereas art materials you don't yeah you can create lots of art but actually yeah you I do get what you're saying about the uh, you know I have the same questions now of, of the value of owning stuff you know these this stuff that you can't take with you when you're gone sort of thing yes it's nice to have all the all the things you need but I am with you on the fact that I'd rather go away and have a fantastic holiday somewhere exotic than I would own a I don't know, a fancy handbag, put it that way. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Do you know what I'd say to both of you? What? That if you don't like owning things, you're welcome to send me all your art materials. (laughs) Oh, no, we're not talking about art materials. We're talking about art. Oh, okay. Art work. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, but you, yeah, she made me question my answer. So good one, Margaret. Yeah. So I've got, and I think that's bending a little bit because we didn't actually include art trips, did we? Oh, that's very true. Yes. Mm. So black mark there, Margaret. Sorry. Yeah, you're you're disqualified. (laughs) (laughs) I've got Vanessa Ellerman and she says, I'm such an art supply hoarder. I don't need more. I would try my best to buy art and support artists. Nell Cummins, she says, I would buy a piece of Sandra's and Tara's art. That's oh, a lovely nice, answer. You, yeah. you are now officially our favourite listener for today. <laughs> yeah. I, I've got Michael Beckett. I won't be buying any paintings soon. I don't have the wall space. And I have a stash of my own finished paintings that gets first dibs on any wall space that becomes available. As for spending the money art supplies, does spending on shelves and furniture to store the art supply hoard I have already count? I don't know. <laughs> Is that bending it as well? Mm, yeah, possibly. No. Um, Candy Oldfield. For me, an art supply would be a babysitter. There's a lot of rule bending going on there here, is. Tara, isn't there? I don't know if I agree I mean, with this. People are very creative with their yeah. answers. I would use the money to get some much needed studio time alone. <laughs> I know what she means, though. It's hard when you've got kids to, you know, to make art, but. Hmm. I've got Terra Letner's Aeolo. I don't know if I could count it as supplies, but I'd happily spend that in workshops slash classes by favourite artists. See, another role vendor. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a simple question. Yes. Art supplies. Just stick with the question. Art supplies or art. <laughs> <laughs> We've had babysitters and workshops and holidays. Yeah. I mean, come on. 
I've got Katie free to draw. My art supplies are heaving, yet I could happily spend a thousand dollars in my favourite art shops, but I defo choose buying a new piece of art. In a perfect world, an original buy. Oh, here she, here we go again at Carmel Jenkin. Uh, would be a dream to own. Carmel, yeah, if you're Carmel's listening to this... Carmel's almost becoming a sponsor, isn't she? I think she is. I think she is becoming <laughs> a sponsor. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, yeah, I, I would love to own a piece of Carmel's work as well. It would be amazing. Yeah. yeah. I've got Jackie Paluski, and she said, neither. I spent it on an art tour of Spain. It's another blooming rule breaker. Jackie! <laughs> <laughs> Official Colzo art... Hmm, would digital art supplies count? I think it would. Uh, like, perhaps towards replacing my iPad for one with more RAM. I've got Victoria Harris Art. How about an art retreat slash holiday where you bring your art materials, learn and take home your newly created art? Now that's having your cake and eating it, that one. I was going to say, that's just wanting it all. Yeah. You just can't have it all. No. <laughs> Brush strokes and blooms. Buy art materials to use in my art classes for learning disability children that I run. Yes, you can definitely have that one. <laughs> I've got now Lila. Now Lila? Uh, my arts and crap, not a typo, area is full. <laughs> so I, I would buy art as I've turned my garage into a gallery for my work and mostly hang others' works inside my living space. However, the last thing I wanted to buy was $8,000. So if it's only $1,000, maybe I take a trip and go to museums and galleries. Oh, so now we haven't given them enough money. No, I know. God, they're not grateful at all, are they? Okay, so we have a brand new question for you, which is, if you could ask Santa to bring you one art-related item down the chimney this Christmas, what would it be and why? So if you could ask Santa to bring you one art-related item down the chimney this Christmas, what would it be and why? You can tweet us your answers and kick crazies or let us know in the Facebook group, which, by the way, if you haven't already joined, I highly recommend you do because there'll be more stupid stuff in there as well. We will put the question up there and also on the Facebook page and, of course, on our Instagram page, which is Kick in the Creatives. And we hope that gave you the kick in the creatives you needed. Don't forget to pop over to our website at kickinthecreatives.com to find out how you can take part in some of our upcoming creative challenges. And, of course... There you can also subscribe to this podcast so you can never miss an episode. And if you're enjoying the podcast, we'd be so grateful if you'd leave us a little review, which we haven't had actually for a while. So, yeah, we'd love a review. I think we're due a review. So, yeah, feel free to give us a, too, a star rating. Too busy on the blooming yeah. anaesthetic having body parts removed. That's why. <laughs> oh. Anyway, don't forget to check out our podcast sponsor, Evolve. You can watch a 60-minute art masterclass from Evolve by going to kickinthecreatives.com forward slash Evolve webinar. <laughs> oh, and, and the cartoon course as well. Don't forget that's out as well. So you know where to go. Kickinthecreatives.com forward slash. Is it cartoon course? It is, isn't it? <laughs> Something like that. Have a look. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's that too. And if you enjoy what we do and you'd like to help support us at Kick in the Creatives, you can now do so by buying us a coffee. Um, and you can find the link on our website. And we want to say thank you to our latest supporters, and they are Joanna Brown. Thanks so much again, Joanna. Um, really, really support. Uh, appreciate your support. Derek Mumford, he says, thanks for the very prompt help. And that was because uh, Derek had a question about um, his a portrait he'd done and he he sent in a picture and just asked for an opinion and of course we gave it to him and he was obviously very grateful because he get, he bought us a coffee so we were very grateful for that Derek thank you and also Rob Myers thank you so so much Rob really really appreciate your support um you all help to keep this podcast going so that's it for today you know what I'm going to do now Tara right now this minute Go and chop when off I a finished body no no I'm not going to do that guess what I'm going to do right now uh, go and have a I'm, I'm inspired by our own podcast episode. Right, what are you doing? I am going to, I'm going to get my TikTok. I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to make a TikTok. Say. I'm going to get the TikToks out. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I, I'm not that desperate for followers. I'm going to open a TikTok account, or I, I'm going to change my profile picture and make a proper TikTok account. So okay. I'm going to do that now. What are you going to do? Be decisive now. Make a decision. I, I am going to go have a cup of tea 
and then I have to do a little bit of work for Kicking the Creatives and then I'm going to carry on working on my website. Okay, brilliant. So we've made a decision. Everyone else, now off you go. Make a decision as to what you're going to do next to move your art career forward. And you will hear from us again in a couple of weeks. Bye. See ya. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you did, perhaps you'd like to share it and leave a review for us on iTunes. Back soon. Yeah, but they, I do think imagination can be taught somewhat. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. You're talking about being brave and open to experimentation oh, now, aren't you? I was thinking you? I'd done that bit. Yeah, <laughs> how, do you know, how do you know that? Well, I just used my imagination and thought, wonder what Tara would talk about next. <laughs> yeah.